This is a typical university in the United States, offering its students many activities besides studies and scholarship. The American University calls its grounds campus, implying an area where many things take place beyond the classroom. There are 3,500 students on this campus. There are 76 clubs and organizations. Americans believe this should be so. It's part of learning the social graces. Here, a candidate for the traditional student assembly attempts to draw the attention of his fellow students to issues he imagines are vital. Fourth, to renew interest in the welfare of each new freshman class. We must guide them by our, our good example along the lines of university pride. We must also remember that their evaluation of Loyola is determined by our attitude toward Loyola. If we actually got down to assist the freshmen when, when they came to this university, if we gave them something to be proud of, in four years we'd have hardly any problems. We wouldn't have a, an incompetent student body as we have today. We'd have more people out here listening instead of sitting down or out in the cafeteria. The student here belongs to three, four, even five or six clubs during his time at the university. To him, it's not necessary that his clubs stand for anything significant or important. It's enough to join and belong, a preparation for the social demands of the intricate economic world he'll be entering when he receives his degree. But these films were made at Loyola University in New Orleans, Louisiana, in America's Deep South. Today in the United States, beyond the university walls, beyond the apathy of most of its students, looms the great problem of black and white. Which of America's educated young will face it? Twenty-year-old Kathy Barrett was once a student at Loyola University. Now when she visits this Jesuit school, it's as a worker and organizer for SOC, the Southern Student Organizing Committee. Colored and white young Southerners who believe in fully equal rights for every Negro in their land. This girl is one of only a few. She is not representative of a large movement in the American South today. What she may represent is an emerging conscience which will bridge the past with the future in this part of the world. But if you ask the Southerner, he would say that this is impossible, that a Southern girl from a good family successfully studying at a good college would break off her education to become totally involved with the civil rights movement that the Old South considers alien and disruptive by its very existence. And for Kathy Barrett herself... One of my struggles as a campus traveler is to realize the need of students like myself to make their education a complete personal experience. I know that lots of times when myself or my friends are meeting Negroes in the movement for the first time, they'll hear the Southern accent and come up and ask, Where are you from? You tell them and at first they don't really believe you.
your legs that used to run Where are your legs that used to run Where are your legs that used to run When first you went to carry a gun Oh, I fear your dancing days are done Johnny, I hardly knew Today, Kathy Barrett's New Orleans is a representative American city, a booming consumer's economy, ever-increasing business opportunities. In fact, the economic foundations which made New Orleans a great cotton port and slave trading center have disappeared. remains in New Orleans is a hard and fast social structure for the Negro fixed in men's minds by the past by history. The students at Loyola, I feel, are very indifferent about the racial problem. They make up a part of the society that had the attitude that I would call moderate, which means to me that they don't care, attempt to make a decision about civil rights issues. Loyola is a very typical university in the sense that everyone there doesn't think like the majority. Some of the students at Loyola, a small group of students, are very much involved in expressing their opinions about the civil rights issue and acting on those opinions. Is there integration now in Louisiana? I wouldn't say there is integration in Louisiana. In Louisiana, we have what might be called token integration or desegregation in a couple of the schools and a couple of the parishes and some desegregation of public accommodations. Kathy, what is SOC? SOC is the Southern Student Organizing Committee, an intercollegiate, interracial organization composed of campus group affiliates. These campus groups are made up of students in school who are concerned about issues such as civil rights, peace, poverty, university reform, and how to deal with these issues. What is nonviolence? Nonviolence to me and to some people is an expression of love lived as a way of life in everyday moments from one situation to the next. It is a way of life embodied in an attitude that refuses to fight back when attacked. Don't these people know how to protect themselves? People who 
use nonviolence in the movement or who believe in nonviolence also have learned a way of self-protection. A friend of mine in Hattiesburg who works with COFO was, this is sort of an example of nonviolence, was stopped one night by the police and they asked him to get out of the car and began beating, beating on him and he protected his body the way that he was taught to protect his body in the movement. And this is how you do it. November of 1960. These are scenes of white New Orleans mothers and youngsters. They are protesting the first desegregation of two New Orleans public schools. They succeeded in giving their city a bad mark around the world. They rioted against the small Negro children in front of the New Orleans City Hall and in the downtown streets until the police were called out to keep order. And at this same time, the Louisiana State Legislature to the north in Baton Rouge tried to close the public schools. Failing this, they gave sanction to dozens of private, white, segregated schools by giving grants of money to the protesting parents. For the first and not the last time, the real problems of race were to be avoided in Louisiana. Well, the only thing I can go by is the fact that when my child's school was integrated the following fall, we had none of the trouble that they had in the preceding year. This school over here in this district had none of that. We had no rioting. We had no one out in the street. Everyone either kept their child out of school that year and sent them somewhere else or they simply went ahead and put their child in school like they always do. Has there been any change in people's feelings in New Orleans in the five years since? I don't think so, because this same school has decreased in enrollment almost half of what it was. There were around 220 children there. Now they're around 176, I think it is. None of the people whose children have been put in private school have taken them out, even though it means that some of them are in second-rate private schools when they could be in first-rate public schools. What do you think will be the final outcome of the situation? Well, this particular school is in danger, of course, of being closed entirely if they get down to below one-third enrollment, which they haven't quite reached that yet at the moment. They're almost 50% Negro. And of course, the Negro enrollment goes up every year and the white enrollment decreases. So that you can see ultimately where this school is in danger of becoming, again, a totally segregated school, but it'll be black now instead of white. Today, Kathy Barrett's New Orleans also includes what must be America's best image of itself, suburbia. I'm Myron Wilson. Uh, I'm a sales manager for a, uh, an electronics and uh, housewares manufacturing firm. I feel that I have a relatively <clears throat> moderate viewpoint on the civil rights issue. I feel that uh, the pace has slowed somewhat. We don't seem to have too many problems, generally speaking, in uh, Louisiana. Perhaps there are some, some immediate and quick dangers if, if in an area where people are not willing or ready to accept uh, total integration. Uh, there can be some serious problems. I don't believe that, uh, that it can be forced on people against their will. I think that they will look for places and neighborhoods to live that they like and perhaps they find uh, more desirable from the standpoint of the absence of Negroes or perhaps Negroes will look for the absence of white. I think that this has to be a thing that's done uh, according to a person's personal feeling. Well, what, for example, do you think of civil rights workers in the South whose efforts sometimes bring violence? Well, uh, again, uh, we have to go back then to, to the Southerner himself. Uh, the civil rights workers seem to uh, pick on uh, the South 
uh, because this is where they get their most immediate reaction. Uh, perhaps they're looking for the kind of publicity and the national attention that some of the violence that accompanies their demonstrations uh, get them uh, in the southern uh, states. I think perhaps that they'd be less noticed uh, in other places where they are already uh, more accepted than here. I think this is done on purpose, and uh, I think that they're looking for publicity, frankly. Well, I think they're pressing a little too hard. The Negroes are trying to take over. I think they should be slowed down. Are there recent events which make you think this? Yes, I don't believe in the marches. King tells you that if there's a law that he don't like, he's got a right to violate it for the good of his people. Well, I don't think he's got any more right to violate a law than anyone else. What do you think will be the eventual end of this movement? Well, I think the politicians, the way they eventually throw their way to decide it, I don't think that King can get by unless the politicians let him do it. Do you think such a thing as true integration will ever be established in this area? Oh, I think there's a lot of people that'll work together, that colored and the white for Years we worked, many colored people, and had no trouble at all with them. They were all happy for years. If prosperity and financial security tend to make people resist change, there are also those whose inherited livelihoods and traditions would be completely destroyed by the emergence of a new culture. Without setting ourselves up as a model, I would like to, as far as we can go, recommend to all of you that you follow the pattern that has been set in Little Rock, Arkansas. <laughs> The very idea of an emerging Negro culture is resisted most of all by the Citizens' Council. Its intention is to keep the Negro, 32% of Louisiana's population, from gaining a status equal to the white. The New Orleans Citizens' Council is dominated by the man known as the Judge, a man who is political boss over the nearby swamplands of oil-rich Plaquemine Parish. He is Leander Perez. Be it resolved by the citizens' councils of the New Orleans area, representing approximately 50,000 adult citizens, that the United States Congress be memorialized to enact necessary laws to prescribe minimum qualifications for justices of the United States Supreme Court of at least five years' service as judges of courts of record in this country and that may be native-born Americans dedicated to the principles of the United States Constitution in its entirety, including the Bill of Rights. All in favor of adopting that resolution and sending copies to the judges of the Supreme Court and members of the United States Congress, say yes. Thank you, my friends, and that will be done with your party. The object of the Citizens' Council is to give to every decent, patriotic, white man and woman an opportunity to join together and to let those nine treasonable judges know that we will never, we will never surrender and desert our little children. These little children are part of the traditional New Orleans Mardi Gras that was instituted by refugee aristocrats in the late 18th century. 
Even today, New Orleans has what is perhaps the oldest and strongest class structure in the United States. It is this class structure, together with apathy and old prejudice and vested interest, which seem to conspire against the desperately needed reappraisal of the racial situation in the American South. The Negroes have their own Mardi Gras royalty, but that's in another part of town. And it's an irony the civil rights worker must face that this apathy knows no color bar. You had the better hold on. Before you can count One, two, three Yes, they will Yes, they will Listen, fellas You know it's not all the time That a man can have a good woman A woman that he can call his very own A woman who will stay right there at home And mind the children while he's going to work a woman who'll have his dinner cooked when he comes home. Where some men make mistakes when they go out and stay because they feel that no other man wants his woman but him. But listen. If you think no other man wants her, just throw her away. And you will see some man will have her. Before you can count One, two, three Yes, they will Yes, he will Southern regional offices of the Congress of Racial Equality are here in a predominantly Negro section of New Orleans. This is one of a dozen civil rights organizations, all of them in loose cooperation, aiming to bring equality to the Negro through voter registration, equal legal rights, employment opportunities, and education.
modern girl's custom of collecting pictures and clippings. Here, it's files on the rights organizations, numberless papers on the Ku Klux Klan, the Citizens Council, and Louisiana state government committees set up to prevent integration. And stories of the violence over race which mar the Americans' own image of a placid social scene. Including this paper by one of Kathy Barrett's former sociology professors at Loyola University, Father Joseph H. Victor, which created a storm of controversy in the city when it was published in 1964, a report of incidents of police brutality committed by members of a police force who are otherwise noted for their excellence. A Negro woman came voluntarily to the same station when she heard that the police wanted to question her about a crime charged to her husband. She said, the same lieutenant beat me after he started to question me. He kept slapping my face and beat me with the back of his fist in my stomach. Then another one started. They called me a black bitch and a nigger bastard and worse names every time they asked me a question. And they kept beating me. This woman maintains she did not know anything about her husband's alleged crime and could not give the police the information they wanted. It is a matter of police record in this case that she was released after three days because of lack of evidence. Richard Haley, on the right, has been Southern Regional Director of Corps since April of 1964. In this interview, he discusses security precautions in relation to the Philadelphia, Mississippi incident. Uh, we were talking of this uh, earlier today, some of the members of staff, of the necessity for having a very strict uh, procedure for security precautions. When I leave a community, to, uh, there is someone who should know when I leave, where I'm going, when I'm expected to be there, and in case any part of that procedure does not uh, operate according to the initial plans, then it's the responsibility of all those who know to get in touch with the proper authorities at once to try to find the missing person. This was the tragedy of Philadelphia, that the persons who died were missing at least six hours before it was known that they were missing. Uh, this is a, a terrible lesson that we have learned, and it is one that we hope not to repeat. Richard Haley talks about an interracial student seminar taking place in New Orleans. It seems to me that we're just beginning to learn the depth of the sort of um, separation that has come about between black and white out of the culture in which we've grown up. The seminars help us to break down the wall. That sounds trite, but one doesn't really realize until he goes to a meeting such as this that for all of his academic knowledge and college background, he has a, he has a lot of inhibition regarding his uh, relations with other people who are of different skin color. It's not until he gets thrown head on into a conversational confrontation that he realizes that uh, I've been harboring quite a few uh, misconceptions and prejudices that either I didn't know or I wasn't willing to admit. These students are the exceptions. They assemble for two and a half days at New Orleans All Negro Xavier University. I noticed down in Orleans Parish that uh, you've had some changes too that indicate that uh, this section of the state doesn't feel the same way as it did. Uh, this student, Francis Patrickwin, is director of the conference. His uncle in Baton Rouge is a member of the Ku Klux Klan. The speaker on the final night of the seminar is also an exception. State Senator J.D.W. from East Baton Rouge Parish, perhaps the single integrationist in the Louisiana State Legislature. Whatever. These students do play out their daily lives according to their vision of a completely integrated society. And this is hard. There are few places they can go together after their seminar. 
What makes it doubly hard is that their contemporaries think the civil rights workers are, at best, starry-eyed idealists. For it would seem as if, with the rise of the prosperous American middle class, each youngster is warned, protect your interests, mind the status quo. Apathy is no crime, and perhaps it's a virtue. Take up my musket to shoot them anymore But I ain't gonna love them And that's for safe and show And I don't want no pardon For what I is or am I won't be reconstructed And I do not give a damn Good evening And welcome to our television show Meet the Senator Today we're coming to you From the football field at Ole Miss And our guest is Senator Phil A. Buster Of Hotbed, Mississippi Good evening, Senator Howdy, boy Welcome to Mississippi Now, I Senator uh, There seems to be an awful lot of commotion Going on out there On that practice football field uh -huh. Do you have any idea What's going on out there? Yeah, we got our first nigger Come out for the football team oh, <laughs> That is wonderful Wonderful, my ass oh, that's not We try to keep that nigger off the team, but he said he'd go see old Lyndon, bud. So we decided we'd give him a break. Oh, well, that was good of you. Yeah, we're gonna break his neck, legs, and ass. <laughs> Oh, I done talked to the coach. He done guaranteed me on the first play from scrimmage. Uh -huh. Two of our roughest boys gonna grab hold of that nigga. Yes. One gonna kick him in the eye. Mm. Another gonna kick him in the belly. Mm. Then I got two more boys gonna grab his legs and make a wish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then I got three more boys really gonna hurt that nigga. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, wait, which one is he out there? The one with the red cross painted on his helmet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, look at that. He's getting ready to get the ball. You better grab that nigga. Yeah, you better call that nigga's ass. He's just got through two players. You better get well, that nigga. He got through three more. He has to clear. He's going for a touchdown. Damn, look at that Puerto Rican run. <laughs> Colored students hang out around here. See that tree with the ropes on oh, yeah. it? <laughs> Just below the New Orleans French Quarter, in the district Tennessee Williams used for the setting of streetcar named Desire, is this bar and dancing spot, the Dream Castle. A city ordinance forbids mixed groups from drinking under the same roof. Here are Negro laborers, graduate students, and civil rights workers in town for the weekend from their projects in the state of Mississippi. do you relate to people of another race in situations like this? Well, I guess the best way is to greet them by saying, what's happening? Because then you show them you know exactly what is happening. There's so much work for everybody in the movement in the South now. I'm responsible for visiting all the campuses in Louisiana and Arkansas for SOC. Today, I'm off to Lafayette and the University of Southwestern Louisiana 
Kathy Barrett, SOC campus traveler, departs on one of her tours of Southern universities. She'll meet opinion very much at odds with those of reform, of change. Even here in New Orleans at Loyola University, the challenge comes not directed so much at the cause of reform, but at the spirit and motive of those who work for it. There are the young who are rather naive and emotional. They mean well, their intentions are good, and they do not see that more harm than good is coming by pushing these demonstrations to the extreme, violating the rights of peace-loving people, such as lying in the streets, uh, uh, even, for example, uh, disturbing public order. Now, these people are naive, and whereas their intentions are good, they're, not, uh, they're so young that uh, uh, they don't see the harm they're doing in the circumstances in which they act. Then there are the other group, they're not quite so naive. I would say this is a minority group, a very small group here, nevertheless a very well-organized group. These people are those who are malicious in their intention to get their ends. Uh, one of them, I would not like to mention his name, has mentioned the fact that we are going to bring out the worst in the white man. When you want to bring out the worst in your fellow man, it means you have a hatred for him. Hence, they are pushing demonstrations, putting down impossible demands, which demands, when they are not met, only arouse frustration in whites who are of both evil themselves or whites who are of goodwill toward the Negro. Both are frustrated because they cannot meet these impossible demands. Hence, when the frustration mounts, the intention of these demands is to move the white man to perform some overt criminal act and then to point the finger at him and say, see, you are a criminal. This is to push the cause of those who are um, interested in the movement more than just for the rights of the white and the Negro, but who are interested in the movement to get some selfish, mo selfish end of theirs attained, see. Here you have a satanic attitude, a malicious attitude, which only hurts the movement because it pits men of good will against men of good will as well as men of evil will against men of evil will in both camps. If I was a student, I'd do it myself, so certainly I wouldn't have any reservations about students doing it. There's always the problem of uh, observance of the law, so certainly I wouldn't condone anything illegal, but as far as students doing, say what uh, Miss Barrett is doing, taking a year's leave of absence from school to work with uh, the Southern Students Organizing Committee, uh, that type work with students going into Mississippi in the summer to help in voter registration drives and things of that nature. Certainly as a personal opinion, I'd feel it's uh, a thing I admire an awful lot in them and certainly to be commended. And as strange as that view might be thought by some of my fellow Mississippians, I was born and raised in Mississippi, and I think the work that the Southern Students Organizing Committee is doing this summer trying to get Southern college and university students involved is particularly significant. Uh, as far as my personal opinion goes, I'd be gung-ho for the students doing things like Gaddy Barrett is doing. Well, I, th I think that it's important to note the significance that uh, uh, radicalism on the campus is a form of extra-political action. By that I mean that it's action that falls outside of the normal political processes in the United States. I, th I think that just as some students in this country have their blast by, uh, during their uh, Easter vacations in Fort Lauderdale or Daytona Beach, these students with a political inclination have satisfy their urge for action by involving themselves in political demonstrations and picketing uh, and uh, actions of this sort. And whether it involves civil rights or pacifism or free speech, so-called, uh, th this is how these students satisfy their urge for action. Well, I'd like to say that I believe each to his own. I wouldn't do it. I think if they'd involve themselves in more constructive efforts, they'd all much be better off. I doubt sincerity of many of them. I doubt their sincerity and their motives also. I think it takes a lot of courage, especially if they're from the South. And I think they must really feel deeply that they're doing something worthwhile. Thank you. And if, if, to, if to say anything at all, I'd have to say that I think it, do, it does nothing but start a little bit more trouble than it's already uh, existing. I, don't, I just don't understand it. This is the Mississippi River as it winds its way to the Gulf of Mexico. 
The river has changed its course many times since the days of the Spanish and French conquerors. In the midst of these snake and mosquito infested swamps lies an old Spanish fort built to stand guard on the river which has since wandered away. Fort St. Philip is in Plaquemin Parish, ruled over by Citizens Council leader Leander Perez. Here in 1963, Judge Perez proudly led newsmen on a tour of the fort, now prepared for those who wish to demonstrate against the status quo. This is not set up for Negroes so that this little rat, Bobby Kennedy, can use the 14th Amendment on us. This is set up for demonstrators, white and black. And if they choose to demonstrate, to uh, lead uh, a drive for anarchy and the breaking down of government in this country, if they cover the Plaquemines, they'll be treated accordingly. There's no discrimination. We'll put them all in here without discrimination. Leander Perez, with all his irony, could be considered an amusing public figure, except for the disturbing rumors about the New Orleans area of how Negroes and Plaquemen can totally disappear in the night, never to be seen again. The same man has prepared these bunkers, these fences, this concentration camp in the swamp, miles from anywhere, for black and white together as a grim joke. A joke for people he considers to be muddled-headed communists. Bobby Kennedy, the one the boy attorney general had advised Farmer and his core communistic directed group to attack, to come into Plaquemines Parish, and by error, core went into Plaquemine Iberville Parish. But I can assure you that if Farmer and core had come into Plaquemines, we would not have had uh, the long difficulties they had in Plaquemine and Iberville Parish. <laughs> Kathy Barrett skirts Plaquemine Parish. She doesn't go there. It is perhaps the most dangerous single place for civil rights workers in the South. But she and all the civil rights workers say they'll go there someday, someday soon. This is a land where a girl, according to Old South genteel traditions, does not travel freely or alone. Kathy's tour takes her first through White Castle, a small Louisiana town where her father happens to be principal of the one white school. The family actually lives in Baton Rouge. This is the Louisiana state capital, site of tremendous chemical and oil refineries, and center for the largest Ku Klux Klan in Louisiana. Kathy grew up here in a modest residential district. Her sister's a high school senior. Because of Kathy's civil rights work, Mr. and Mrs. Barrett now get to see their daughter only occasionally. As for her parents, who are born and bred Southerners, and their feeling about their daughter's work. Initially, when Kathy got interested in this work on a uh, real active basis, uh, I was concerned about uh, what the reaction of my family would be and what uh, people who were associated with my husband and his uh, career or profession would think. But uh, more and more as uh, Kathy has gotten involved, uh, I have, you know, tended to be unconcerned about those things because I, I really think that uh, it's um, what is... Uh, ultimately right that we all have to be concerned about and not what somebody else thinks about our situation or even wh how it would affect my life personally or my husband's career or profession. And uh, I don't think that uh, it makes any difference anymore what, what uh, I mean, as far as I'm personally concerned. If he were to lose his job tomorrow, we, we would find something else to do that would be better. I think Cassie's a born idealist and is ideally suited for this type of thing. 
This has always been a pattern of her behavior, I think, ever since she was a small child. Uh, I look upon this, uh, my generation, let's look back uh, a step. And in our case, I think what we did, we rationalized ourselves into a position of where we ignored the problem, said the Negro was happy, and we let it go at that. But these people are, are doing something. They're an extension of our conscience, if you want to look at it that way. The road from New Orleans leads 80 miles north to Baton Rouge, then turns west 86 miles to Lafayette, Louisiana. The further north you go from New Orleans, the deeper you get into the U.S. white Protestant South and into the Black Belt. Kathy Barrett's first stop, Southwestern Louisiana State University in Lafayette, attended primarily by students from the semi-urban and rural South. Here she'll meet with a group called the Ambassadors in an attempt to organize them as an affiliate of the Southern Student Organizing Committee. The Ambassadors are an ordinary, well-behaved group of American students. They don't have extraordinary political or social views, but most of them feel a little apart from the mainstream of events on the campus because most of them are Negro. SOC is made up of student groups like the Ambassadors from colleges all over the South. There are approximately a hundred affiliate groups now that have joined SOC in some way or another. It's not a membership organization as such. Groups that have affiliation with SOC are made up of at least five people, and they are voted into affiliation by the executive committee at the request of the local group. There is no group that makes decisions for any local body, so that the ambassadors, like the group that I belonged to when I was in school in New Orleans, remains relatively autonomous. But in your program, uh, you are going to run into problems that maybe you've never had to deal with before. And by keeping in contact with the other students through the newsletter and conferences, you can read or discuss with them the ways that they dealt with the problems that you were running into, and then make a decision yourself about how you want to deal with it. Bring up new ideas yourself and discuss the alternatives. So I think that it's pretty much left open to you now to ask me questions about SOC and see if you want to take a stand at this meeting or just, you know, find out some more information about SOC <coughs> and we can discuss it. You can let me know if you're interested in affiliating. Should students work for civil rights organizations? I don't believe a student should work for civil rights organizations. I just don't think so. Oh. Uh, no, I don't think so. I would be definitely opposed to working for civil rights organizations. Definitely not. I don't believe so either. The temper of the Southern community is such that people here, on the race question, have to make a decision. It's very difficult for them to avoid it. To me, the hope lies in the younger generation. The middle class apathy of the older generation is a part of the American system, and as much apathy as there is displayed on the part of the Southern white moderate, to me, some of this obvious apathy is a reflection of guilt and at the same time, somewhat of an openness. If students really learn the meaning of education, of themselves, of the world, of specific problems, and they are able to internalize this idea, or this feeling, they can only express it if they relate that to their background and understand their background. I concentrate on students who are concerned, who care, most of these students feel that education is meaningless if they're just learning to repeat what they've heard in class, writing down on a piece of paper and getting a grade for it. They feel that they're learning something about themselves. A young revolutionary temperament, simple youthful idealism, how much sacrifice is really involved for southern white middle class youngsters who emerge from their worlds into that of the Negro and of civil rights. This is summer in Jonesboro, Louisiana. These are friends of Kathy Barrett's picketing a grocery store which refuses to serve Negroes. 
anyone in the civil rights movement must face the possibility of the commitment of conscience which calls for a complete sacrifice of dignity in the name of principle. This is a garbage truck of the city of Jonesboro. And when I see students, Negro and white, who can deal with their background, deal with themselves, and deal with their view and what their life should be like, then I can see some potential for the South, for America. I think that the problem we have in facing the race issue is not only for Southern students to deal with their backgrounds, but for students and people all over America and the world to be able to deal with simply their backgrounds. It would all but appear that the spirit of revolt has gone out of the prosperous American nation, founded itself on a revolution. Those who do revolt are considered by some traitors to their families and the way of life that brought them into existence. From my travels, the people I've talked to, liberals, moderates, conservatives, whatever you want to call people, I think that since this problem is so intense in the South, and that since the problem has been dealt with on a deeper level in the South, that the potential for change lies here. If the white Southerners and Southern Negroes can be called on to make a decision, if they can be educated, they can deal with the race problem here in the South. My belief, and the main reason for my involvement in the civil rights movement, and my determination to deal with this question as a part of my education, is that I don't think I'm free, and I don't think I can be, with others enslaved, black or white. My struggle with the people of America and in faith with the people of the world is to establish democracy here and now. <laughs>